Hello, husband, father, sons, brothers, uncles, and nephews. I'm Dwayne Shig, and I want to welcome you to Encouragement for Encouraged Men. I'm trying to do two or three things at one time, but I want to welcome you to our program. We have a fabulous program today. This is uh, our monthly men's program to encourage men, to strengthen men, to shed uh, a better light on men. And so that's what we're doing. That's the focus of this particular program. And I have some dynamite guests with me today. And I thank all these gentlemen for uh, for being with me. This is uh, one of the one of the four. I don't know what three is called a trilogy. I don't know what four is called. But this is one of the uh, things that we do once a month. Uh, I do something different on my program. This this time we're talking to men, and then the rest of the time is on Thursdays. Uh, we talk to we have encouragement for self-published authors giving them exposure and um helping them with you know doing those things and then the next week we have uh we interview entrepreneurs people helping them and then once a month i do a mini workshop to encourage people to strengthen people. that's what we do and let me introduce our guest today we have some as i told you some fabulous uh men we have an author, coach, he's the author of Prepared for Takeoff, youth minister, youth pastor, Minister Antoine Garrett. How are you, sir? Antoine, can you hear me? Does anybody else hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. I can okay. hear you. Okay, so we have Antoine, Walker, Antoine uh, Garrett with us. He's, as I said, he's an author, uh, coach. And we have with us also, he does have a master's in nonprofit management. He's the author of a book called Something Told Me, Pastor Frank Bozan. How are you, sir? I'm great, sir. How are you? I'm doing well, doing well. Thank you. And we have pastor of Love Lifted Me Ministries. He's the owner of Asante Farms in Alabama. He's coming to us from Inglewood, California, and he also happens to be, according to the Bible definition of great, the greatest minister I know, my uncle, my uncle, my uncle, Bless you. Bless you. Good, good. And uh, I guess Antoine's going to come back with us. And we have this young man. Now, this title is long, so I have to figure out how to say it, see if I pronounce it right. He is a cardio- Echo, echo cardiographer. It's <laughs> close enough. Cardiographer. And he has been the uh, administrator, administ the cardiology administrator at different hospitals. Uh, husband, 36 years, and yeah. have been brothers and friends since the eighth grade. Mr. Ty and Ho Knowles. <laughs> right. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. How you doing, man? Great. How are you? I'm doing real good. It is it is great to have all of you gentlemen here. Uh, glad that you came to you were able to come and be with us on this uh, this program. Uh, we are here to to change the narrative, if you will. We are here to uplift uh, uplift men. And uh, get back. Can you hear me, sir? Okay. We are here. We are here to change the narrative. We are here to, uh, as I said uh, in my uh, promos, we're not here to complain, compete, or compare. We're here to help construct construction of brothers. And so that's why we're here. And I want to talk to you gentlemen, because each of you gentlemen are doing some, uh, some great work. And, you know, you can uh, share this with your people on Facebook, on your particular Facebook pages. Um, they can see it on my Facebook page, and so you can share it on your Facebook page also, so that uh, your people can, can follow you. But I want to talk to you about being a man. We want to talk about a variety of subjects, but obviously there's so much going on right now with the George Floyd situation and just uh, shining the light once again on you know racism in America. But I don't want to talk about it from a perspective of they're great. This is wrong. But talk about it from the perspective of what can we do about it, and also look at some of 
some of the progress. And so I know some people may say we haven't made any progress, but uh, just the other day, I believe her name is Ella Jones. She just became the mayor of Ferguson, Missouri. Mm -hmm. uh, right. Brown. And so that's a step in the right direction. Uh, with the Floyd situation, these cops were arrested, all four of them. That's a step. And then with the Ahmad Aubrey, uh, all of the, those gentlemen were arrested. And so that's that's a step in the right direction. And I think if we can handle uh, this a little bit better, um, we can see the progress. I want to ask each of you a question. Can you think of a time that you have been a victim of racism and how did you handle it? I want to go with uh, Minister Antoine first, Ty, Frank, and then my uncle, because he came up at a place called Thomasville, Georgia, and mm. then deep, 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 deep south, and then moved to uh, Austin, Texas, and spent some time in Vietnam. And so uh, there probably was some racism, racism in that area. But uh, Antoine, if you can remember a particular time, earliest time of having to of having dealt with uh, that, uh, how did it affect you and how did you handle it? Um, you know, it's interesting. I think the earliest time that I recall racism was probably during the time when I was a student at Hampton University, okay. um, born and raised in New York. So traveling back and forth to Hampton uh, down what's called Route 13, there were sections of Delaware and Virginia um, where almost every time coming through that area, we were pulled over. Uh, and there was never a legitimate reason for pulling us over. It wasn't a speeding. It wasn't anything like that. Um, but we were pulled over. And on one occasion, they did want to search the car. Um, but my, my best friend who I was with uh, made them aware that his uncle was in law enforcement, so he knew what his rights and responsibilities were. But it made me from that point forward suspect about police. Um, and it made me suspect about, because each time there was a white police officer, uh, there were black police officers on the force, but we were never pulled over by black police officers. So my earliest engagements during my college years were only with white cops. And so I began to question, you know, what we did wrong and why the system was like that, that they could just pick black kids for no reason and harass them, at, for lack of a better phrase. Okay. Okay. And so how did that make you feel? And, you know, I guess, how did that make you feel as a, as a person, as a man? Oh, man. So so there was anger, um, but there was also a degree of fear uh, because as a you know young man um, in another state, this wasn't in my state of New York where this happened. This was out of state traveling. So, you know, it brought on a sense of fear, but it also brought on a sense of frustration <clears throat> and anger that people were targeting me because of what I look like. Uh, OK, Ty. Yeah, I, I can recall two incidents um, directly in which I was affected. Um, one was with a, a buddy of mine, and we had decided that we were going to get a pizza one night, just locally here in uh, South Bay. And um, he had to use his daddy's Cadillac, and it was a big boat. I mean, it was a beautiful Cadillac, but it was a big boat, right? And, it, you know, it was really nice. And so anyway, I remember pulling away from the pizza shop and the lights came on, uh, came on and the cop came up to my buddy. I was in the passenger seat and he said, well, where are you guys coming from? We told him. And he said, P pizza, huh? And he says, give me your license. Well, of course, my buddy had no, no illegal illegalities on his license or anything like that. He gave it to him. But then he was not it was not enough for him to look in the car, see that there was no open container, see that there was no drugs, there was no weapons. His license and registration was up to date. But he also asked to see the pizza. Wow. And so at that point, I was a little shocked. He said, I want to see the pizza. Right. And we had it in the back seat. He actually had my buddy go out and open the box of pizza to actually let him look at it. Wow. And I was almost as stunned and used the same words you used, um, Dwayne. Wow. What is that for? And 
the, the way he talked to us, the manner he talked to us. Now, yeah, we were young guys, but the manner he talked to us was as if we had been, we had done something wrong and he, and he certainly didn't believe us. Right. That made me feel pretty upset and it gave me a realization of what was going on right around in the city. The, sec the second incident was myself driving down the famed Sunset Boulevard. Uh -oh. And I had bought a nice new car and had the sunroof open. It was a beautiful day playing, playing some music. And this was back in the 80s. And lights came on. I'm, I'm approaching the beach and the lights came on. I pulled over here again, asks me all, where, where have you been? And I said, I'm just driving down Sunset. And I, I knew I wasn't speeding, mainly because I was just eye gazing from side to side. He had no reason that he ever gave me, but why he pulled me over. Again, it was a fairly new car, the no bumper, no bumper was loose, no tail light. I wasn't speeding, didn't go through a red light. Right. He held my registration and my driver's license, which seemed to be nearly 15 minutes. And at the end of it, he brought it back to me and he said, so do you live over here? And I wanted to, I wanted to respond and say, can't you see on my license? I don't live over here. Right. But I said, no, I won't. I said, no, sir, I don't. And I'm just out driving. He says, so why did you choose this area? And I said, I'm just driving. It's a nice sunny day. And I thought I would drive. And he said, do you know anyone over here? And I said, no, sir, I don't. Wow. And I can remember this as clear as day. I'm worried about what answers am I going to reply? I'm worried about, and I, I wanted to get out the car. And I remember him looking at me and says, don't get out the car. Mm. Because I'm wondering, why are you holding my license? I have nothing, I've done nothing wrong. You haven't even told me what I've done wrong. And I remember him telling me, don't get out the car. So at any rate, I didn't. He gave me my license, gave me everything back and said, okay, continue on. And I knew then that this existed. This was in Alabama, this was in Georgia. This wasn't in the middle of somewhere south, maybe a rebel state. This was right here in Beverly Hills. Ah. That I was being pulled over and I was being questioned and someone looking for something that perhaps that maybe I had done. I experienced it right then and there, and it, I've never never forgotten it. Mm. Now, Pastor Frank, some may look at you and say, he doesn't experience any racism because of his color. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. You've got, a, you got a black wife, you got two black children, and you are, sir. <laughs> uh, I am Norma Kudo. Right. Yeah. I am the lightest one in my family. Um, the joke of a lot of jokes in the bunch of a lot of jokes in the family call me the white chief and all this other stuff. Right. But uh, my uh, great uncle was uh, Dillard Ferdinand Morton, all of us know that Dillard Morton, the, right. the first jazz composer arranged out of New Orleans, um, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, Grand Hall of Fame. But that's, that's, that's where, my, where my family comes from, is New Orleans. Okay, I was born and raised in South Central. Um, my first experience and my only experience so far as getting pulled over was in 2013. Um, hadn't moved to Texas yet. It was a Saturday morning. I uh, lived three miles from the church. I got up to go to one to the church and also to the cleaner. So I started to head to the church, like three minutes from the church. I said, darn it, I need to go to the cleaners first. So I'm on Atlantic Boulevard right off of Rosecrans. I threw a U turn to head back to the cleaners. I don't know where this sheriff came from, but two <laughs> female sheriffs threw the lights on and that pulled me over right in front of the cleaners. I was like, okay, what did I do? You know, so they called, came out. And, Can you step out the car, sir? I'm like, well, why? What other, sir, get out the car. One got the hand on the gun and they're like, okay, whatever. So I got out the car, stretched me across the hood of the car, patted me down, pulled everything out of my pockets. Um, told me to sit in the back seat of the patrol car. Then they proceeded to go through the through my car, looking through the glove compartment, pulled out my cell phone. And I think there's a, a text from you, Pastor Shig, indicate, uh, and the, you call me Pastor Frank. They, they looked at me and said, you're a pastor? I said, yes, ma'am. He said, 
started laughing to each other. And then I hear them talking to somebody on the radio, giving them an address where I'm located with cross streets I was at. And I'm like, what the heck's going on? And then they finally came back to my car and said, okay, so here, just sign this ticket for the illegal U-turn and you're on your way. I was like, okay, that was strange. So I go into Cleveland and head to the church, finish her at the church, head home. Turns out the person they were talking to on the telephone was my wife. While they had my cell phone in my hand, in their hand, they called my wife. Wow. Told her I just pulled out of a motel and had a prostitute in the car. Wow. So I'm like, what? Are you serious? That's like, so I we called my wife, Jenga's brother, the LA Superior Court, Jeff in Eaglewood. So we called him. He gave us the name, the name and number for the white commander at the Compton Sheriff Station. I opted not to call, but I figured it wasn't going to happen anyway. Right. Um, in retrospect, I should have called at least to have it on record of what I, you know, what I went through. But I just couldn't believe they would just lie like that. And and so my brother-in-law said he called it reverse profiling. He says, oh. "Here I am, looking like a white boy, driving through Compton on a Saturday morning. I had to be a liquor drug or one, one of the two. Oh, so, wow. wow! But I, luckily, I ain't got a crazy wife. At least, at least that time she wasn't crazy. You said, you, you said what? <laughs> <laughs> what? Yeah, I was living, man. I was like, what? <laughs> you got me. My, I know my voice went to a couple of octaves. Right. Right, I was just living, man. So, that, and so this didn't help. Oh, okay. Right, 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 right. <laughs> the whole neighborhood looked like this. Uh, Uncle Scuffy, uh, at least one incident, because like I said, coming from Thomasville, Georgia, and Vietnam, and the corporate world, and then we're going to move to productive uh, things about this. Okay, a particular incident you can remember, Uncle Scuffy? I would rather talk about systematic racism. I was born in a time when I actually experienced the black and white water fountains. Oh. Uh, born in a time when if you went to the movies, you had to go upstairs, and the white folks went downstairs. And I think one of the things that was really uh, uh, shaping in my young life, my uncle stayed in Miami, Florida, so my mother would put us on the bus during the summer. And when we left Thomasville, we were on a, they call a trailway bus. You had to sit all the way to the back of the bus. Mm -hmm. But then when you got to Tallahassee, they had uh, interstate travel. Okay. And uh, because it was a interstate travel, then you could sit wherever you wanted to. So I've experienced both sides of the uh, systematic racism as mm. well as the individual racism. Mm. Mm. Now, there are, there are, you know, a lot of times people talk, okay, what's wrong, what's wrong, what's wrong? There can be steps to be taken. Um, Mr. Antoine, you deal with young people, you deal with people coaching them. What would you say would be a step, some things that can be done to change the narrative to help correct. Uh, well, you know, you can't stop people from being racist. As Dr. King says, the law can't make a man love me, but he can stop him from lynching me. And so what would you say that we as a people can do to help change the narrative, to help add some, uh, you know, some correction to this uh, from our perspective? Um, that's a really good question about changing the narrative because um, what what the conversations I've been having with young people, including my own children, is all about the narrative. It's about who controls it and who profits off it. Right. And um, so I think that in order to change the narrative, we have to tell the story. Far uh, too long, far too long, we've allowed other people to tell our story and paint a picture of us. Right. Um, and the responsibility is ours to tell that story. The responsibility is ours to highlight and to share and to talk about. Um, positive things that we are doing in the community, positive efforts that we're putting forth to uh, partner with and collaborate other black men uh, to show that we can, will, and do come together as a community to make changes um, and not just from entertainment purposes, right? So right. I think the, the, the responsibility is ours to tell the story, tell it loud and proud, and to keep telling it even when others try to paint us in a negative way. I love that. Tell the story, tell it proud and loud, and keep telling it even when others try to uh, put us in a in a in a negative negative light. 
I like that. And uh, I was watching another uh, program and one of the young men uh, was uh, our Bible study. We were doing a Zoom Bible study. And one of the young men uh, talked about is how important it is to vote. And sometimes people mm -hmm. don't see that. But the people in Ferguson, Missouri, they voted. And so there was a significant change. There are laws or your local elections, your city council, uh, in some places the police chief is voted on. That is very important. And when you register to vote, you're eligible for jury duty. And unfortunately, a lot of people, they don't do jury duty. And then when there's someone goes to trial and there's not a lot of people on there that look like us, I wonder why. So those are some things that we can do. And you mentioned uh, you mentioned coming together. I want to switch right quick to talk about supporting one another in business and efforts and different things of that nature and how important support is. Uncle Scuffy, can you tell the story of uh, when you wanted to go to school and they wouldn't let you and you told my daddy about it? Mm -hmm. I was... Uh... <laughs> Moved from Austin, Texas to uh, Los Angeles, and I wanted to be an artist. And so uh, I knew I couldn't afford to go to UCLA or USC, so I went over to Trade Tech. When I got over there to register, they told me that I wouldn't be able to go because I was out of state. But if I could come up with a certain sum of money, uh, I could uh, register to go to school. And when I got back home that day, my uh, brother saw I was distraught. My head was down and I was really tore up because I really wanted to go to school, you know. Right. And so he being my older brother, he says, what's wrong with you? And I said, well, they tell me I, I have to pay all this money to go to school because I'm out of state. And he said, uh, how much was it? And I told him, he said, ain't nothing but money. You go on down there and register. We'll get the money together. And so I was able to go to school because my oldest brother was willing to invest in me. And uh, for that cause, I'm, I'm always trying to invest in somebody else. And that older brother happened to be my daddy and he was <laughs> investing in me and my brothers, investing in all of us. But that's, that shows how important support is. And as I've said, each of you gentlemen here have personally supported me in different things that I've done. And so I wanna ask, I'm gonna start with Ty and then go to uh, Pastor Frank. Why do you think it is that the narrative is just that we don't support each other? Why is it that that seems to be what, what's in the limelight most of the time? Uh, Ty and then Pastor Frank. Well, that may be the narrative for some, and, and there's probably some truth to it. Mm -hmm. But I, I must say, with the movement that I've seen recently, mm -hmm. we, have, mm -hmm. we now have the opportunity to change that narrative. Okay. And I don't know why that is believable and for some people, but I believe now, 2020, going forward with this new generation, with the new technologies of, of, of people linking themselves to each other worldwide, just what we're seeing each other, how we're talking today, gentlemen. Right. That we can change the narrative going forward by supporting one another and starting it now. I'm not sure about the 60s, 70s, even though I was around, but I'm not sure why it wasn't there then. But I believe now we have an opportunity with the energy that's been driven for us just recently. I see this as an opportunity of going forth that we can really create something mm -hmm. that will be, I should say, it would be historical. Okay, okay. Pastor Frank, um, yes, sir. dealing with um, you know, what we were just talking about and support, being supportive of people, why do you think that has been the narrative for so long that you know, we don't support one another? Well, I think for, one thing, I don't think we've been as cohesive as we probably should be. You look at the Asian community, they will only do business with their own people. You look at the Hispanic community, because one family wants to buy a house, four families are moving there, they want to help somebody buy a house, and then we cannot help somebody else pay for a house. They're, they're, they're more cohesive. The 
black community has we've been self-destructive for too long in my eye. Right. Going back to 1992 with the Rodney King uprising, Yolanda's brother had a shoe store, and the his dad was standing in the front of the store as they were burning all the other buildings down, the radio tracks and other buildings. He's standing up there right in front of you, going, black home, black home. They right. took him out the way and burned it down anyway. So we become our own worst enemies at times. Okay. And I think it's part of it, part of it because it's a long time we didn't have anything. So when we get something, we become very really, uh, protective of it and want it for ourselves rather than learn how to care and help each other to grow. So as I just said, I think that narrative is going to start changing because this new generation is not having it. Um, and I think we're going to see a lot of change coming to the place. And I think these young people are really going to step up when it comes to voting this year and help us to do the right thing to get us back on track again. I, 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 I understand that. I like to uh, focus on the fact that, okay, now, and, and I believe uh, Minister Antoine uh, alluded, it to, alluded to it, the changing the narrative and showing that there are plenty of people that do support uh, book, your store, your whatever the case may be. Sometimes the problem is information, knowing that you're there, but also knowing what support looks like. I want to uh, ask Minister Antoine and then go to uh, uh, Pastor Dick. Um, you're an author. Uh, you, you're a speaker. What does support look like? Okay, you want people to support you. What does that mean in a practical way as it relates to your books? Uh, you know, when you go on Facebook, okay, they hit a like. Is that supporting? So help somebody understand how they can support you as an author or another friend as a business person a speaker, whatever the case may be. So I think there are levels of support. Um, liking or sharing someone's post about their business, their product, their service is one level of support. Um, because ultimately, as a business person, you want people to purchase your product, right? You want people to buy your book, your service, whatever. Right. Um, but in the event that they're not, word of mouth does help. So that's a level of support. And so, so liking and sharing posts and retweeting or reposting, those things help. But if you can, by all means, buy that, you know, per, buy that product, buy that service, show up to that event where that person is speaking. Um, and that would be helpful. You know, I think that support also looks like if you see somebody doing something and their product isn't, you know, the best or their service isn't the best, support isn't going online to blast them. Support, ah. is, support is pulling them up to say, hey, bro, hey, sis, here's, you know, especially since we're talking to men, hey, bro, let me tell you, this is how, you know, here's where I see that things went a little bit left. Maybe if you made this adjustment, you would attract more business and keep more business. So I think support is also being willing to hold each other accountable. Oh, that's a good, a holding each other mm -hmm. accountable. Mm -hmm. Other stuff for you, mm -hmm. been in business, the science, mm -hmm. I talked about that in other areas. So in a practical way, what does support look like? Help some other brothers to support their brother, their cousin with their business, their whatever the case may be. What does that look like in a practical way? How would you help someone uh, understand that? I would think that uh, if you're in a business, you have to realize that you are an example. Uh, and whatever your endeavors are, you should try to be at the top of your game, first of all. Because our community will only give you that one shot. And if they they feel that you're not, not where you're supposed to be, you know, they'll they'll spread it out. And so starting with the person, you have to be on the top of your game. Okay. And then I think uh, one of the things that helped me when I was in business, I was uh, always trying to form a relationship with my customers. You know, nowadays, everybody want to tell you how much it's going to cost and you got to do blah, 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 blah. You know, but you should have to work on a relationship with the people that you're doing business with, first of all. And then it'll spread uh, word of mouth. Ah. And if you can build that kind of relationship then you have a solid foundation. And uh, you no, know, the Bible said do unto others that you have them do unto you. Right. You have to be supportive of somebody else's movement as well as yourself. 
Right. And people will see you supporting somebody else and they will come along and support you. And sure. I think uh, we should realize that we are in a position to create a narrative because somebody else is always looking to see how you're doing it. Ah. And you should spread it so that person that's looking on will have an example of how to do it. That's my feeling on that part of it. And always be willing to, to go beyond what you're called to do in order to gain others around you. That's good. That's good. Uh, mm -hmm. You just mentioned, and um, uh, Pastor Antoine mentioned it, and I think others have said, the narrative, that's so important, the narrative. We have to be able and willing to control, to change the narrative, uh, because to correct the narrative, because so many things... Uh, get get misunderstood unintentionally and some intentionally because of the narrative with uh, the kneeling when Kaepernick first kneeled mm -hmm. and you know the focus was protesting police brutality but then the NFL world and the media world and the other people they switched the narrative to disrespecting the flag and it had nothing to do with the flag right and technically I looked it up and there is a uh, such thing called flag etiquette. And I looked it up. And you know why when the military comes out and they roll the flag and they hold it sideways? According to this uh, document that talks about respecting the flag, that's disrespectful because the flag is never supposed to be held horizontal. I mean, they'll be held like that, according to this document. So mm. they're saying what we're doing is disrespectful. But in actuality, every Sunday, they're disrespecting the flag. <laughs> <laughs> but the narrative got switched. And so we have to be able to control the narrative. Talk about somebody that has a good book. Talk about somebody that has a good service. And so those are the things that I see that uh, we can do to help that. And I want to talk about, there's so many things I want to talk about. I want to talk about economics. I want to ask each of you your very first job. Now, this is economics, but this is also a man lesson. And I want to talk about man lessons as it relates to responsibility. My very first job was at a record store called Flash Records on the corner of <laughs> Jefferson and Western in Los Angeles. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yep. It was across the street from or down the street from where Ty lived. And That's I right. started working there when I was 12 years old. I walked in there, asked Miss Reynolds for a job. She said yes. And I was selling candy to the school kids and filling up the soda machine. Mm. Anybody under 30 to have no idea what I'm talking about because I opened up, put bottles in there. We ain't talking about cans. Right. <laughs> and so that job introduced me to the music industry. Uh, so many people came through there James Brown, the Stones, uh, a lot of producers, Hal Davis, he wrote uh, Dancing Machine. Uh, through him, I got a chance to go into the studio and do a lot of things in the music business. But that was my very first job. I want to ask you, uh, Ty, your first job and how did it make you feel? That's I'm interesting you would say that. My first I'm job... You the trash at your house when your grandmother told you to take out the trash. <laughs> that, that. that continues to be my job. <laughs> but, I would say my first job was my toughest job. And it taught me a lot about working. And it taught me a lot to respect these people. I worked at a McDonald's mm. near USC campus. Okay. Was what I would say to me was the busiest McDonald's in the city <laughs> because when the Sunday's football games came in and USC was rolling, it seemed like there were just thousands of people in our McDonald's. And it wasn't so much of the cooking part of it, but it was so much of the cleaning and the mopping and get a broom and dust and this and clean this out and take care of the trash and that. But it taught me what I had to do. And it taught me to be accountable to showing up on time because I needed I needed at that point, that little time getting ready to go to college. I needed that little check and my family needed that little check. And. I understood, okay, what I have to do, put the trash out. I have to mop. I got to wear this little corny little outfit with a little corny hat on top of my head. <laughs> and I, that has been, to this day, the toughest job I've ever had. Are you serious? Okay. It's the toughest job I've ever had because it was a nonstop 
customer service focused job. Mm-hmm. Okay. But it learned me to really appreciate what working is. Ah. What real work is. Okay. Um, we, we all know people on an eight hour job today, this maybe maybe people don't work the whole entire eight hours. That's just really? I've seen that. Uh, yeah, I've seen that. And so that job, there was no hiding. It was continuous. Do this, do that, sweep, mop. And I had to really check my uh, my own abilities to feel who I was. Right. You know, and say, oh, I need to mop now. You really want me to mop? <laughs> oh, now I need to take out the trash and sweep? Oh, and when you finish that, go do this. And this was all the kind of things that we all had to do. Right. And so... That was my first job, and it taught me on being um, uh, really uh, focused and doing what I had to do. Now, when I say my first job, let me be truly accurate, gentlemen. I don't share this with everybody. That was my first job job for I worked there, I think, a month or two. My first job, I worked in a circus. I think Dwayne knows that. I won't. I, okay, I won't share anything more than that. And I was not. The, I was not the clown. Okay, you can move on, Dwayne. <laughs> well, what he did do? No, I won't. I won't, I won't do that. I won't do that. <laughs> I remember that. That's <laughs> right. We all went up there together. <laughs> right, and I learned a lot of social things in that encounter, also. <laughs> but look like that would be something to be proud of. How many people you know that ever worked on a circus? Let me tell you something, Pastor. It is. I, I'm very proud of it in the sense that uh, I learned 10 different personalities as a young 16, 17-year-old trying to make enough money to get to the prom and grad mm-hmm. grad night. Right. From the guy, the trapeze artist, mm-hmm. the, the guy that exploded through the cannon, mm-hmm. the guy, the lion tamers, you know, mm-hmm. all had different personalities. They all just said, hey, kid, go pick this up. Kid, go do this. All right. And some some really liked us. Yeah. Some did not care for us a lot. <laughs> but nonetheless, we showed up. We got paid cash every show. And it was it was a lot of fun. But I, I learned a lot and I'll never forget that experience. I remember that. I Good remember. experience. Good experience. It was. It Good. was. And so uh Pastor Antoine and then uh Pastor Frank, your first job and how did it make you feel? What you learned? Yeah, my first job was working for um, something called the Youth Resource Development Corporation. I grew up in Poughkeepsie, New York, which is halfway between New York City and Albany. So um, my job was uh, refurbishing, going to state parks and refurbishing um, historic items. So we had these wire brushes and we have to scrape the rust off them and repaint them and all of that kind of stuff. But this was a summer job. And so we had to wear long sleeves because we were out in the park. So it didn't matter what the temperature was. You had long sleeve, pa- long sleeve pants and long shirt. Um, and what this job taught me was teamwork because uh, there were a bunch of kids that looked like me. And we had large areas that we had to cover with all of these historic relics that we had to refurbish. And it was our responsibility to come up with the strategy that the team lead kind of left it up to us to figure out who covers which area so that we got everything done. Um, And so I learned about working together, about cooperating with others to get a common task accomplished. Uh, Um, And and so that's one of the things that has has stuck with me about building coalitions to attack problems. That's Mm. good. That's That's right. Then uh, Uncle Duffy. Yeah, I too started up at at McDonald's. Um, I I know the story that Ty was at Donald 20 years of Figueroa. That's right. When it first started with the mini mat at the back. That's right. (laughs) Yes. Um, What McDonald's taught me was a strong work ethic. Um, Ty was right. It was nonstop. Um, It was about people building, building people skills. Because as I grew up, I stayed with it for 10 years. And so as I grew up and became store manager and what have you, it was the people part of it that I that I that attracted me the most. Mm. Uh, I was told I never made it in management because I was too nice, but I grew up learning to treat people the way I would want to be treated. So before I would ask one of my co-workers, uh, crew members to go clean the restroom, just stop me cleaning the restroom. Ah, so mm. I learned to lead by example. Before I have them ask them to go clean out, out the grease trap, they see me clean out the grease trap. Ah. So. 
um, by learning by learning by example. Um, I still practice cleaning as I go in the kitchen here. Um, that came from McDonald's, you know, because you know, I always have to keep things rolling. Um, I prided myself on the fact that a uh, supervisor came in one month time to, to grade it for the surprise group that he went for to do there. He walked around the store in the middle of a mad rush hour. And he looked around and he came back to me and said, I finally found something wrong. I said, what? He said, the rooms are hanging crooked. That's right. That's all you got. And uh, the reason I moved up into McDonald's is because they thought that I was black. And about then, you had the equal opportunity to go And then I was looking at me, looking like a black boy, talking about, now you say you're black, right? They say, yes. I give my vote to you for you. Right. But uh, McDonald's was the grooming for me for the rest of my job. And it, um, it was after that, after McDonald's, I went to Fort County, then in uh, County, the last 35 years after McDonald's. But McDonald's paid the way for everything else. That's great. That's great. Your first job, you, you've, Uncle Scuffy, I know you haven't really had a job in a whole bunch of time. You know, you're working for yourself, but can you remember a, a first job and what it taught you? Yeah, I worked for your daddy. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Dwayne's, uh, Dwayne's father had a maintenance company and he had a contract with this uh, grocery store at 18th and La Cienega. Yeah. This is back in the 60s, and it was, uh, we'd get up early in the morning, had to be at work at 5 o'clock, and we would clean the store, and someone had to be there throughout the day to maintain the floors or somebody broke something, and uh, just be there. And so it was during the time of Passover, and the Jewish people, they buy like two and three baskets of food for Passover. And so the store manager asked me, if I would like to uh, work that weekend for the store. And I checked my big brother and he said, make that money, make that money. And so I spent the weekend bagging chickens. Mm. Gentlemen, I bagged so many chickens until I got to the point I hated the smell of raw chicken. <laughs> and so at the end of that, they asked me, do you want to work for the store? Once again, I talked to my big brother and he said, go for it. And that job I, was the best job because I was at uh, a point in time now where I am now able to join a union. And the union had benefits and the union had protection. And I worked my way through that situation until uh, after Vietnam, I became a store manager with Vaughn's Grocery Company. Mm. That was the training for it. Okay. Ah, okay, and so no that how was to, that was helpful in know how to um, getting, send this to him. Getting uh, Ty, turn your mic off. Uh, that was the. This says private. How do I know I'm sending it to him? Ty, turn your mic off. Turn your mic off. Uh, that was training for all the different things that that you may be doing. You know that you're doing. Uh, you know that you were able to do and get done at a, at, a, at a later time in your life. And I understand that um, some of the things that each of you all mentioned, what you do, what you did at that first job helped you throughout, you know, so those first lessons stay with you. You know, I mm -hmm. learned commitment, being a work on time. I learned all those different things. They, they stay with you and then they influence you. Uh, it influenced, you know, my direction into the music uh, industry. Uh, I used to work for Lamont Dozier. Uh, he was a writer, wrote mm -hmm, mm -hmm, all that kind of stuff. But it, it introduced you into all of that. And giving you some, some life lessons, I want to ask you about man lessons. What, well, Frank, you mentioned, and I alluded to this, you mentioned uh, on a comment from last month's show when we were talking about having people to show you different things, you said you and your brother didn't have that. So, mm -hmm. and lessons that we were talking about, how did you learn though, not having, you know, I'm assuming your father in your life, how did you learn those man lessons? Well, the backdrop to this is that my dad died when I was 12. Okay. My mother had been divorced since I was nine. And even before that, I have very few recollections of him. He was a master carpenter, but he was a chronic alcoholic. Okay. And alcoholism is what took him out. So my life lessons from him was one, 
I ain't going out by being an alcoholic. Okay. And even though I didn't have a father to tell me what to be, I grew up wanting the father, wanted to be the father that I never had. Okay. So um, I overcame that by. I, I did, didn't even really have another male figure in my family. My brother-in-law um, was a lot older than myself, and he didn't really discipline his own children, so I, I kind of watched him away as a, as a little model. Um, there was really nobody else around me. Mm -hmm. So I had to kind of make up in my own mind how I wanted to be growing up, how I, how I would raise my children, what kind of what position I would have toward um, raising kids and getting married. And, um, it was pretty much, I was self-taught and I learned by the school of hard knocks. I did a lot of things I shouldn't have done. Um, made a lot of mistakes early on in my marriage. Um, so I had to learn by trial and error um, and come to the knowledge and, and admit to myself that I could do better than I know I'm doing. And it was after I got saved that I finally found a role model in the past few years ago. And he helped me um, in my growing process as a man, as a husband, and as a father. Okay. Um, and that wasn't until I was in my late 20s. Uh, um, so was, I had a lot of growing things in the middle where I was, I was lost. And I didn't realize it until later in life. Okay. Hi, what, uh, how did you, you know, the man lessons, the things that we teach our sons, the things that, you know, men know that men, men need to know, where did yours come from? For me? Yeah. Uh, mine came from, um, you know, blessed as I was, I was raised in a house with the mother and grandmother. And so not knowing, you know, dad was not around, mom and dad split very early in my life and I just did not grow around, grow up around dad. So again, raised by two women. It was the fact that when I, by the time that uh, I reached high school and uh, also being an only child, I might add, uh, by the time I reached high school, I you know, met a few friends and then here, here here's, was a major issue. I had some friends, and actually one main friend, you know I'm doing, is Hal, right. whose father took all of us in as his sons. We was at his mm. house every weekend for about four years straight. <laughs> exactly. And he never, he and his wife never hesitated to make us feel as though we were one of their sons. Right. And consistently. And I could, not only did I see not only was it just how he talked to us, but it was also how I saw him interact with his wife, how I saw him interact with his children. Now, coincidentally, he also was a God-fearing man, saw him in church, saw him getting ready to go to church, saw his dedication to the church, saw how he handled some problems. I'll never forget how he you know, smoked a cigar Never forget his, you know, his Mercedes that he's had, that he had, right. his nice cars that he's had, that the nice he area he lived in, huh? That pipe he smoked all the time, and the pipe he smoked, and never forget how he treated everyone in his family, and then again, never forget how he treated me. And I always said that I would treat my son, my family that way, and it, he he gave this man a manifold on how to live as a young man early in life. It's important. Um, Antoine and then uh, Uncle Scuffy, uh, it, he talked about having examples. So what what examples, let's see how I wanna say this. One of the greatest man lessons that you've learned and what do you hope that you know, being an example of a particular, their particular quote unquote man lesson that you've learned that you hope, you desire, you continue to spread to your to your children and their friends, being that example, if that question makes sense. Yeah, it, it does for me. Um, and the example I think that I hope that I had to learn over time 
um, where I had to unlearn to learn some things. And what I had to unlearn was that keeping it all in is not strength. Keeping it all in is sabotage. Um, And so what I hope to pass on to my kids and what I try to do a better job of doing is talking to them about things, issues, their feelings, just what's going on. Um, Because what I learned through what was going on around me was that everybody kept stuff in and nobody talked about it. Um, And as a result, I have a history of keeping things in and not talking about it, but it didn't help me, it only hurt me. So I made a decision to to stop doing that and to do better about talking with my kids and listening to them. Um, So that's the lesson I hope to pass on to my daughters and my sons. That's very good, that's very good. Uncle Scorpio, is there a particular lesson, man lesson that you instilled and you really hope that uh, Simeon parents and Seth have caught? Uncle Scorpio? I have, uh, I had the example of my second oldest brother whom I stayed with and he was in the Air Force, a God-fearing man And so being in the Air Force, his life was really structured. He would get up every morning and go to the base and he would come home about four o'clock in the evening. And everything Mm -hmm. was pretty much disciplined because of his military background. And so uh, what I've tried to do with my boys is to teach them structure, but having them to understand that life's gonna throw you some lemons. Yeah. And when these things occur, you can't fall apart. You got to still be the man of the house. Right. And my favorite saying is got to will make you do. And so when you find yourself in conflict, you still are responsible for those whom God has given you charge over your wife and your children. And so uh, got to will make you do will make you do what you got to do. But what if it's not fair out there? What if it's tough? I still got to do it's, all that stuff. What if it's, it's tough? It's not a fair world. The world is not fair. Nobody the world is hire. not fair. They don't want to no, hire. Sir. They don't want to give me a chance. <laughs> uh, one of the things that I, I think that we have to get past is what other allowing other people to dictate what we have, what we can do. Ah, very good. We have to stop letting other people dictate what we can do. Because one of the things I've found out in life is there's something that you really, 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 really want to do. You find a way to do it. Yeah. Yeah. And be successful at it. And be successful at it. Good segue. I want to drop this. Um, My father was not in my house, but he was always in my life. Yes. You know, I tell people I wasn't raised by a single mother. My mother and father were divorced most of my life, but. I saw my daddy all the time and talked to him all the time. And if I messed up, I'd see him a lot more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, and so, uh, but my daddy was probably the hardest working man I've ever known. Yes. And, and I tell, I tell people my daddy is the greatest man I've ever known. All right. Mm-hmm. All right. 10 years he's been gone and I still miss him. Okay. <laughs> Work ethic, responsibility. Yeah. That's what I learned from my daddy. Mm-hmm. My father would come over, and I didn't know what alimony was. I didn't know nothing about that. My father would come over every week. You know, I'm arrogant. I think he just coming over because he want to see us. <laughs> that too, but you know, alimony, child support, and all that kind of stuff, and. My father had uh, my father had a, a a gambling problem, and the problem was with gambling that he lost most of the time. <laughs> mm. And so, even that, he still found a way to make sure we had stuff, mm-hmm. and responsibility, and integrity. That's one of the reasons my why uh, my word means so much. If my daddy yes. said to do something. If he didn't do it, because he couldn't. And so I think that's something to pass on. That's something to illustrate. Uh, keeping your word, integrity, 
right. and responsibility and circumstances don't have to dictate what you can do. As Marco said, you can find a way. And I want to segue into something. Everybody has something that they're good at. And for a long time, you know, people, I was stuck in just existing, get up, go to work, come home, go to bed. And I know there are some people that are stuck in that, but then find their it to help them keep from just existing. Ty, you have a skill and a career. Because you have that, you will likely never just exist. You know, you'll you'll have work because what you do is everybody can't do what you do. Everybody can't even pronounce the title of what you do. <laughs> <laughs> and so I want to ask each of you to talk about how it makes you feel, how important it is to have a skill, career, talent, gift that will always get you through and to help somebody, some fellow listening to search and discover their talent or get the skill. The skill that you have, uh, again, I want to ask each of you to take some time and help somebody recognize that there's something in them that they can do so that they can not just exist. A skill, a dream, a, a gift, or something. Uh, your skill, Ty. How does it make you feel? You, you know, it, I do feel blessed. Um, at, at one point in my career, I said my biggest challenge is going to be to perfect what I do, uh, continue education. And then at another point, it's, it said to me, I must bring up another. Oh, that's good. And so I did. I did. I did at one point hire and had an all Afro-American lab. Uh, and it was the only in Los Angeles. <laughs> and I trust me, gentlemen, it was at a time point in which there were not a lot of others that thought we could manage that skill. But I handpicked them. I hand trained them. Mm. I gave them parameters of successes and failures. And they're all working right now without me. Okay. And they're doing quite well, quite well <laughs> economically. <laughs> uh, I would say this is that, and I, and I hate to segue from where you're going, Dwayne, but I would say, just listen to all the intelligent men I've heard this, this afternoon, is that, gentlemen, this is where 2020 will make the change. This is where all of you young, all of you young men, we have a, a challenge to teach another. We have a challenge to teach a young man or young woman how to help, how to perform, and then show integrity and build a relationship. Very good, very good. Because as I looked on television last week and I saw the, the, the protesting, I saw the looting, I saw all of that, and I'm not here to argue that one way or the other, but I'm gonna say this. We have an opportunity to reach out to people and show them right now, and it may be just an instruction on building that relationship on showing you how to barbecue. It could be how to paint a room. Right. It could be how to change a tire. Very good. All of us here, as we go forward, have that ability of something we've learned to help a young man or a young woman get a relationship, whether it is with the Lord or just with yourself, so you could have a chance to instruct them and then maybe help guide their way. God knows there were. I had a lot of mentors. Dr. Brooks was a huge mentor for me Yeah, and showed me a lot of things. But we have the opportunity right now going forth with this movement, with this technology of Google and technology of which you, you want an answer. It just takes the time for you to type it. We didn't have that in the 60s. We didn't have that in the 70s. All we had to go to was up to the library room and hopefully find the answer. Gentlemen, we can help a young man or a young woman help achieve their dreams, okay? And we can do that and help them dream and help wow. them hope. That's good, that's good, that's good. Help them dream and help them hope because the things, the dreams that they see 
or the hoax right now are totally astray. They're totally astray. And let them know that it's okay to fall. It's okay to fall down on your face. But guess what? You got two hands. You got two legs. You're going to get back up. I'm going to show you how I got back up. Ah. So we have the opportunity right now. And I'm not saying go in the roughest neighborhoods and find the roughest, toughest guy. It may be someone at your church. It may be your cousin. It may be your nephew. It may be the kid next door. Right. To be a mentor in his life or her life and help them right now as we go forth. Because we can't let this movement just die. Well, we can, and and that's lined up with what I'm I'm asked, I'm talking about. Your skill, your gift, your talent can show them that they can uh, they can do. Uh, Minister Pastor Antoine, I want you to uh, do the same thing. Your skill, your gift. You're an author. You're a very good speaker. You're a coach, and all those things. So help somebody. Talk about you know how that how that helps you to to get to know to develop. Uh, a skill, talent, gift, career, and help some some guy watching understand what that can do. Um, you raise a great question, and Ty, I think you were spot on in talking about harnessing the energy and and helping to move folks forward. Um, it's interesting because uh, when people ask for a bio and stuff like that, they say, you know, what your coach, your author, your speaker. I was deathly afraid of public speaking. Um, absolutely hated it. Um, I, I would get nervous. My, my voice would crack. I would do all of those kinds of things. And the thing that I would pass on is the thing that helped me to move beyond my own fear. And that was to embrace the opportunity. Um, for me, when I have an opportunity to speak to someone, I realize that there are a million other people that could be given that opportunity. Um, and so I try not to squander the opportunity that I'm giving, given um, to speak to someone. And that's actually what I would tell a young person. You have opportunities. And when you have them, try not to mess them up. Now, sure, there are, you know, somebody will watch this and be like, hey, I remember that one time when you, yeah, I messed up a bunch of stuff um, and, and still mess up stuff to, the, to this day. But the responsibility that I have is to remind people that it's about progress and not perfection. And so while we can make mistakes, when we have opportunities, we got to put our be best foot forward. But if we fall, like Ty said, if we make poor decisions, and I won't even say mistakes, if we make poor decisions, because what we saw in that moment was what we thought was the best thing for us, turns out it wasn't. But if we make those bad decisions, that you don't have to live in that decision forever, yeah. that you can change your perspective and change your actions and do better. To Ty's point, what I would tell a young person is, um, you have fire in your belly to change the system. It won't change overnight. And it's on guys like us who are a little bit older than the young people to harness their energy, connect it with the wisdom we have, and help them chart a course forward. What happens with movements is they die out because motivation disappears. If we can help them stay disciplined, then the change they're looking for and we've been looking for is will happen. Mm -hmm. Very good, very good. Uh, then Frank, same thing, your gift, your talent. Uh, with painting, with uh, connecting people with uh, Frank, yours, writing, numbers, and everything like that. Having that skill, what did it do for you? And all the same thing, speak to some guy who needs to recognize he has a skill and what does it do for him? Pat, like, like Antoine, I was both more afraid of public speaking. Uh, in my book, I talk about you being a high school. I was high school valedictorian, but refused to give the valedictory because I was not worried I was going to get the graduate speech. And then God, God calls me to preach. It's like, what? No, you know, I can't do that. Um, I've overcome that quite a bit through practice and determination that I, I need to go, go past my fears. Right. Um, but I, what I want to speak to someone is um, there's people that can do better for themselves if they go back to school. 
a lot of people are saying, I'm too old to go back to school. I, you know, I, I want to do this, but I don't have the, the background. I don't have the piece of paper. I was 37 years old when I finally went back to school. I had a full scholarship from USC, Loyola Marymount, USC, and California. What, what, what one quarter at Loyola Marymount dropped out because I was frustrated because for some reason, I wasn't understanding calculus. I had calculus, but now it wasn't clicking. It was a So I got frustrated. And I was awarded a, a one year leave of absence without jeopardizing my scholarship. The next thing I know, it was 12 years later. I married to Yolanda. We got two kids. And I tried to go back to school when I was working a fast paced job, very, um, very high paced job. And the timing was wrong. So my son went to the Navy, my daughter was off on her own. I thought, okay, time to go back to school. Age 47, I started going to seminary at Church One. Got my bachelor's degree in uh, theology. 2004, I enrolled in at uh, University of Phoenix. Been there for four years. Got my bachelor's degree in accounting. Went on to get took my master's degree program in nonprofit management. Wanted to pursue my PhD at USC, but I was a sister pastor at the church, working full time, taking two classes at a time for my master's. So my GRE scores went as high as I wanted them to be. But I said, if I stop going to school, I'm not going to pursue my PhD again. So I did my MBA. When I finished my MBA, I was 60. I said, okay, I'm done. I don't need to go I got all these student loans part of it. I'm good. Yeah. But I just want to tell you what it is. If you want to go to school, it's never too late. My wow. mother got her back in the age 53. My son in law's mother just got her back for a master's degree at age 75. Wow. You know, it's never too late to pursue what you try to go after. But don't be afraid of you know, the scholarships that are out there, there's programs out there to help fund you to go. Um, I, I've helped people fill out their uh, applications for, for, to, to get the Pell Grant and whatever else they need to try to get going. But don't do, there's people out there, there's resources out there, there's money out there. Just go back to school. That's what's stopping you from pursuing your dream. Very good. Uncle Scuffy, uh, gift, skill, talent, yours, what did it do for you? And talk, talk to some some guy about uh, about that. I feel like the odd man out. Mm -hmm. uh, all you guys are talking about uh, education and going back to school. Um, someone made the statement that you don't have to go into the worst neighborhoods for 30 years, I've been going, having the worst guys, the guys from the worst neighborhood. That's been my ministry. Right. The worst guys from the worst neighborhoods. And I've come to realize that there are yet people in our society whose school is not their main thrust. Right. And uh, Asante Farm is uh, 15 acres that I'm developing that a person that has spent his life in this concrete jungle can come and see open spaces. Open spaces. You're not crammed on top of one another in an apartment building, but open spaces. 15 acres of rolling hills and ponds and trees and you had one with nature a real farm uh it's in a no zone area where i can actually take a young man and put a gun in his hand and teach him how to use a weapon mm, it's I a place where a young man can come and i can actually show him how to do something with his hand right and feel good about himself at the end of the day Right. So part of the problem with homelessness and everything, you have so many people out there who don't have an avenue in order to fulfill that gut feeling down in their stomach. Right. And so Asante Farm is designed to give uh, that person who's uh, at peace with working with his hands. We have a woodworking shop. Uh, we have welding and we have skills life skills where a person can feel good about himself when guys used to come into the ministry i would ask them what do you enjoy doing that thing which you almost do for free right that's your passion right. Right. your shining right. shoes 
right. whether it's uh, clean and rimmed on a tire, uh, a car, or detailed on a car, that's your passion. And what has happened to our society is there are people who have passions but no outlet for their passion to be fulfilled. Uh, At the end of the day, if you have not completed a task and you have what I call bragging rights, you have that sickening feeling in the pit of your stomach. And that's what drive people to use drugs. And that's what drive people to drink because they see everybody else succeeding in something, but I don't have anything to succeed in. And so my avenue is somewhat different from most people because when you start talking about a farm, you know, everybody look at me like I lost my mind. <laughs> but what it does, it gives that individual. And, and I'm, I'm saying that it's not for everybody. Right. But it gives that individual. I think the whole thing is about exposure. Uh, you know, if you have been exposed to the outside world, nobody can convince you to give your life for two colors, one or the other and put your life on the line. But if you've been exposed and you know there's a whole new world out there, you look at them like they're crazy. And so what Asante Farm is, I call it the extreme vacation where people can come and look and see, and then they can go back and go to school and get their degrees and be all that God would have them to be. Mm. But at least they will have had the experience. Right. Good. Okay. Okay. That's good. Farm, and it's in Alabama. Got two lakes on it. Uh, tell people how they can contact you, or if they want some more information about it, uh, how can they reach you on Discovery? Pastor Shig at gmail dot com. Very good. Very good. I want to. Um, I want to. Uh, two more things I want to talk about before we close, and we're talking about gift it's skill uh for a long time i just existed get up go to work come home go to bed i knew there was more to what i was supposed to be doing than just the jobs i was doing and that caused me to be frustrated watch this shameless plug that uh i'll talk about that in my new book <laughs> it's going to be released on june the 20th it's called mm. encouragement from a formerly frustrated dreamer uh, mm. Encouragements from a formerly frustrated dreamer. I'll be having a um, virtual book signing and book launch on the 20th of June. And so I'll be giving all you information, you that are here with me and you who are uh, listening. But just existing, uh, I knew there was something more. And so rather than just have a job, I, I got a skill. I went to school and got a class B driver's license. Now that was not in the direction of what my life would go, but it afforded me the opportunity to have a skill where I know I don't have to just exist. I don't have to take any job. And with that, your know, class B license, I've never had a problem with finding a job after that. So mm -hmm. that was the freedom of having a skill. Now a dream and a goal, my passion as I was going to talk about um, is when I was younger it'd be pushing people down but now I'm pushing people up <laughs> uh, pushing people forward someone called me a dream quicker one time but that's what I do now that's my goal that's my passion um and telling people you 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 have a gift each person here has a skill a gift everybody uh watching there's something that you can do and then there's something that you have to do so hopefully they they they, they marry themselves and i didn't know my skill my gift was uh pushing people encouraging people uh when we'd be hanging out ty uh and i was usually the one that made people laugh I didn't know that was a skill in terms of I thought it was just you know a 16 year old dude being silly. So one day at school, um, this girl that me and my brother Kenny knew, uh, she broke up with her boyfriend. And you know when you're 16, that's the end of the world. And so uh, I was on one part of the campus, and Kenny came and got me and said, "I got a job for you. I need you to cheer her up." That's all he said. You know we knew what the circumstances was, so my job was to go make her laugh. At 16, 17, you don't know that that's a skill. You don't even know that that's a gift. But once I discovered that's what I'm supposed to do, I'm running with that. And what I'm saying is 
those of you watching, brothers, you have a gift, a talent. You can learn a skill so that you can move forward. You don't have to just exist. And when you just existing and you get frustrated, you get drunk, you get high, you run women, you beat up people, you steal. But you don't have to do that. And I want to talk about two last things before I let you gentlemen go, because I know you're busy. I want to talk about overcoming and taking advantage of opportunities. People mess up. People make bad decisions. People mm -hmm. do things they shouldn't do. But it's not the end of the world. Mm -hmm. Uncle Scuffy, Pastor Frank, Ty, and Antoine, if you want to share something that you've overcome, do that. But help some brother know that, you know, getting arrested is not the end of the world. Losing some money is not the end of the world. On the, uh, the books that I've done and the events that I've done, I've lost thousands of dollars. That's how I know my wife still loves me. <laughs> <laughs> you <didn't> love me. <laughs> I lost thousands of dollars on events that nobody came to. And my wife is still here. She's in another room. It's not the end of the world. You can't overcome. So right. with uh Uncle Scuffy, Pastor Frank, uh Pastor Antoine, and then Ty. Talk about how you've overcome something that seemingly devastated you and helped somebody know that you can still make it. Got about 15 minutes at 20 I was platoon sergeant in Vietnam and uh, lost a couple of guys and had to write letters and really told me up inside came home from Vietnam and mad at the world even though I'm working a job, but I'm mad and tore up inside. And I tell people today that if uh, crack had been around in the <laughs> old days, we wouldn't be having this conversation today. Okay. Because everything that they had out there, I tried it except heroin and probably the only reason i didn't try heroin was they had a needle <laughs> right and i never liked needles. when i stand to talk to people i tell them i wish i could tell you that i didn't know what seagram was or bacardi or tangeray or ripple but all of that i went through that but god allowed me by his grace and his mercy to overcome all of that, but it gave me the experience to be able to mentor people who were stuck in those situations. And so I spent the 30 years because of the experiences that I had mentoring and helping other people find deliverance from their dilemmas. And as you was talking a while ago, one of the abilities I learned in Vietnam was to be able to tell a man to go to hell and not make him mad because everybody had a gun. <laughs> and so I can negotiate and I can talk to most people. And I think that's my gift. Great. Mm -hmm. Great. That's Frank, overcoming. Mm -hmm. Well, without going into too much detail, um, my situation uh, was my early part of my marriage maybe the first four years. Um, I don't think I would have to myself of being a husband because I wasn't acting like one. Mm -hmm. um, caused great destruction to my marriage to the point we almost got divorced. We never separated. I slept on the couch. <laughs> the room. But we, were, we both made up our minds. We wanted to try to make things work. Okay. Okay. Things, things didn't stop right there. A couple more things still happen. But uh, after the first one, I said, okay, if I get past this, I don't care what the devil throw at me. We ain't got much of this time. Um, but that has become my testimony. We, we, Yolanda and I both witnessed and shared our story with countless other couples going through marital issues. But there's nothing so strong to separate you 
that the Bible says can't be forgiven and should be, and we should be forgiven for. Um, anybody else who went through what Yolanda and I went through would probably have been divorced or somebody who would have been dead. Right. Um, it, was, it, was, it was pretty devastating. Mm. Um, but God held up a mirror and showed me me. Oh. And I had to, I was supposed to be the covering for my family, and I had taken away that shield. And I allowed my, my lack of discipline and my lack of being the man I was supposed to be allowed everything else to take place. So I had to step up and be what God called me to be as a husband, as a father, as a priest of the family. Um, I wasn't saved at the time. Um, left a lot of it because I was going by what society said a man should do and what a man can do. Um, it's like I got caught in that trap, but there is nothing that can't be repaired if you're really, really willing to work at the, at the relationship. Um, I didn't do it just for the kids, I didn't do it just for the lobby, I did it because I was on mandate by God for fix it, and um, to this day. My family, at, at first, my, my family was like, how could you stay? How could you do this? Hey, now they say, oh, we're glad you did. You've been an example for us right. of how, how to go forward. So there's nothing that God can do in your relationship if you allow him to do it. Mm -hmm. Right. We're coming. How long have you yeah. been married now? This September will be 44 years. Wow. Oh, all right. All right. All right. Praise God, brother. 44 years. Yeah. Overcome. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, yeah. Pastor Antoine, overcoming, getting through, uh, how did you do it, and help somebody know that there is life after dot, dot, dot. Uh, that's an interesting question. And I was sitting here thinking, which story do you tell? Because yeah. there's so many things that you, <laughs> so many ways you, <laughs> so many ways you fall, so many ways you fall short. Um, and I think the biggest thing for me was the unforgiveness that I, and, and this is going to be interesting because it's not necessarily me falling, but it is. Right. Um, my dad wasn't part of, my biological dad struggled with addiction longer than I was alive. Um, he passed at, when I was 39, he had been dealing with addiction over 40 years. So um, as a result, he spent a lot of time in and out of jail. And his absence, through his absence, I created um, a story that I told myself. And that story caused me to be rebellious. That story caused me to push away uh, people that were in my space, um, including my stepdad, who came into my life when I was nine. Mm -hmm. And so me overcoming was overcoming this pain that I held on to because of what he wasn't, and in truth, couldn't be because of his addiction. Um, so the overcoming for me was holding on to that difficulty and allowing it to be the thing that pushed people away wow. um, and not not allowing people to get close to me. And it's actually one of the things that I still work on to this day because the thing I wanted the most wasn't there. I refused to ever put myself in a position to want love from someone and get hurt again. Mm -hmm. um, and so I had to learn to be vulnerable, right? Frank was talking about he, Yolanda, my wife and I will be married in August, 22 years. We got married when we were 24. I didn't know what I was doing at 24 years old, getting married. I thought I did, but I didn't know. Um, but even in that journey, I've had to allow myself to be vulnerable, to allow myself to be open, to allow myself not, and, and to force myself not to push her away because I was carrying that pain. Um, so for me, overcoming was about me because it was something I wanted that that person was not able to give me. And so I held that against him and everybody else for a long time. And it wasn't until God helped me see that, that he couldn't give me. The, the man couldn't give me what only God could give me. Wow. Okay. And so that okay. was the part of the release for me. Oh, that's great. That was good. Ty, 
overcome it, help somebody. You know, Dr. Um, Dr. Sheikh, first of all, I want to thank you for having this um, session, this segment, because for I believe this is more of what especially men need. Yes. Um, we need a, a place where we can share with other men, where we can be vulnerable, where we can mm -hmm. have like Pastor Basant, you know, tell what he was lacking in. And Pastor Garrett say what he was lacking in. I just need to say the same thing. If you probably, Pastor Basant, you saw yourself as you were speaking, you probably saw me nodding my head a lot because I went through the same exact things mm -hmm. with my wife in the sense that being raised by two women, Me too. you know, okay. Yeah. Being raised by two women mm -hmm. and not knowing what you didn't know, right. oh. trying to, trying to, trying to look good, yeah. smell good, present right. good. Mm -hmm. In reality did not make you a man. Right. right. And so you had no idea really how to lead a woman. Wow. Really how to lead a household. Right. All you know was you were supposed to say, I do. <laughs> and so really when you said, I do, you really should have said, I don't. Right. Because you really had no idea what you were supposed to do. Exactly. That's good. That's good. And so, and so I said to my wife, and I've said to her many times, I just, God bless you for staying with me for the first 10, 12 years. I had no idea where I was leading this family. Ooh. I had no Ooh. idea where I was leading this family. Now, had two kids, went to work, both had jobs, both did okay, had a home, but I had no idea where I was leading this family. Wow. And was lacking a lot spiritually, as you say, Pastor Basant, was lacking a lot, a, a, a lot in terms of a future forecasting where the family was going to go. And it took me years before I could figure that out through God coming into my life, through some counseling through some inter intervention into my own life and recognizing some of my own personal fears and some of the things I had held on to for years. Right. That manifested, I mean, that got to, it got to a point where I'm just happy that my wife stayed with me. <laughs> but it got to a point where I had to say, where are we going? What am I going to do? How much can I stay with this situation? What's worse is my wife, I believe, said the same thing. <laughs> right. mm -hmm. Now, having said that, we've been married 36 years. All right. Ah. What manifested in terms of link, what you say, what, what can happen when God touches your life? We mm -hmm. then worked with a marital counselor and worked with him in helping other couples. And since I have been on, on radio, I have been doing uh, segments, we have did meetings, with other marital couples um, and helping other marital couples, not only just in, in, in California, but nationally through a mentor and a marital counselor who's very successful. I'm not, I'm not the counselor, but working with someone who's helping couples. The common denominator is that all these gentlemen said they had no idea of what they were doing. Wow. They had to give away up some of their fears and some ladies also, but we are supposed to lead. We are supposed to want to take the hill. And then all of a sudden, we can get up to the top of the hill and go, okay, now, can we go over those instructions again? What am I supposed to do? <laughs> and the young lady looks at us and go, wait a minute, I'm supposed to be following you. Can you imagine you gentlemen who've been in the, in the armed forces? Can you imagine your, your general saying that at the top of the hill? I know, so. Really? Right, right, exactly. So exactly. I'm not following this guy. So, so again, I have been there, um, like Pastor Basant said, uh, Pastor Garrett said, I have been there and don't have all the answers, but still working on it, still improving, got through, got through kids, two kids through college, and am in a happy place. Ah. Okay, I'm in a happy place with me, my wife, and myself. Mm -hmm. And so that has been where I think, you know, I could say anything where I had to reach to the bottom and really do a gut check and bounce back. That has been it is that a lot of people didn't even know it because you because, you know, you kind of put on a facade and everything's fine, but it's not always fine. 
And having a, a, a session like this, Dwayne, I just want to thank you because a lot more men and women need to have segments like this where they can express. Thank you. Can yeah. I can I just ask a question, Dwayne? Yes, sir. Um, Ty just mentioned counseling. And my question would be, I realize that counseling is so important. Why do you think that in our community, that's the last avenue that most people want to take? Because, because I can answer that. I can answer that. Um, a lot have asked that question. And I think the last answer is that when you have a headache, you go to the doctor. You have a stomach ache, you go to see a doctor. Foot ache, you go to a foot doctor. But who do you go to when you have a marital issue? You go to your cousin, you go to Uncle Willie, you go to her cousin, you go to her, her sister-in-law who, and they all have been, been divorced four times each. Or don't have anybody. Or don't have anyone, yet right. they're willing to tell you what is best for you. And so we lean on to that because we become, we, we don't believe somehow in our community, we don't believe that spending those dollars there you go is going to be uh, profitable to our situation or oh, we'll go to the head doctor the eye doctor we'll go to the dentist you know we'll go to the shoulder the arthritis or what have you but we just don't believe that another man or woman can help us with that situation and reality of it is this person or persons have been to school and years and studied all types of scenarios, and your scenario doesn't surprise them. <laughs> and so we, 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 we don't, we don't seem to be, feel that that's a good investment when reality, it truly really is. Thank you. The other, the other side of that, Pastor Scuffy, real quick, is that um, we have been taught for so long, uh, because I did, I went for a year, right? So as a man, A, I'm not crazy, right? So I don't go, right. I'm not crazy. Right. And B, we don't need no help as men, right? We just right. Get man up, tough it out, work through it. And that's not true. You know, we, we can all benefit. Therapy is help. And unfortunately, men have been socialized to believe that they can't let people know they need help because then they're seen as weak. Mm -hmm. And so right. Right. we oftentimes will resist going because we don't want anybody to think we're weak. Right. 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 Another 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 issue is uh, sometimes in our community, we've been taught just, you know, have a little talk with Jesus. Tell him all about you. And while that is true, but have a little talk with Jesus, comma, and then go to the people that Jesus had put on the earth to, to help you. There with you that. go. There right. you go. Right. The right. That, you know, exactly. Therapy. And exactly. Then we don't like uh, as Antoine said, we don't want nobody to know. And my, and my mama says half the people already know and the other half don't care. Ooh, that's <laughs> good, Dwayne. That's good, Dwayne. Half of them already know. Half of them already know. And the other half don't care. And so mm -hmm. that's one of the things that uh we have to we have to those who have started continue and those who haven't started get the help. And be willing to uh, point people in the right direction and where you can help. You've been married, Frank, you said 43? Yeah, almost 44. Almost 44. Uh, Uncle Steffi? 40. 40. Uh, Pastor Antoine, how long? 22. 22. Sky, uh, Ty? 36. 36. And next month, it'll be 38. So people can go to counseling, but if you're going to talk to your cousin, your brother, your neighbor, talk to somebody that has been through it. Yeah, been there, done that. Mm -hmm. Don't talk to anybody that tells you everything is all right all the time. It ain't nothing. It ain't all right all the time. As right. nice a guy as I am, do you know that sometimes my wife disagrees with me? No, you're, you're kidding me. I, I, I find that hard to believe. <laughs> I find that hard to believe that uh, every now and then. But I, I, it's impossible. <laughs> hey, you've been knowing me longer than she has. So you right, that's right. I can't imagine that happening, Dwayne. <laughs> <laughs> Not Dwayne. Yes, yes. <laughs> but go to counseling. But if you do talk to somebody, talk to somebody that's been there. And somebody's going to tell you the truth. Because when I first got married, I was young and stupid. I got married when I was twenty-three. And what I discovered, uh, Pastor Antoine, is that getting married doesn't make you a husband. It makes you a groom. Mm. Oh, okay. That's real. That's okay. real. 
getting it's married to your husband. Right. You were a liar before you said I do, you were a liar afterwards. Right. If you slob before, you were a slob after. If you was lazy and didn't work before, you was lazy and it won't work afterwards. Right. So you have to learn how to be uh, a husband in terms of the word husband uh, in the Bible comes from a word uh, husbandman, a word, uh, Greek word gregarious, and it means the tiller of the ground, so the farmer. Right. So, you know, planting, growing, doing something, bringing something in. So if that's not the guy you married to, you're not, he's not your husband. He's just the guy you live with. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so learning to be that and learning to be a partner, not just a leader and learning not to get my wife to do stuff, but to guide her to stuff. Mm -hmm. And I just learned that lesson two years ago. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a slow learner. <laughs> we all are. I'm a slow learner. We all are. But the key is that you can overcome this if you want to, if you work at it, if you do, if you do the right thing, mm -hmm. if that's what you're supposed to do. Uh, yep. The greatest singing group in the whole wide world since the history of music is The Temptations, and they had a song called The Way You Do the Things You Do. Right. So, uh, overcome it. You can get through. I'm going to close this out, gentlemen. You can get through. I want to save my words for last, but I want to uh, ask uh, each of you, take a minute, two minutes to speak to some young man, some young brother, some young husband, some guy who's uh, lost and don't know what to do about uh, work, about any, about those things. Take two minutes and help him. You're going to go uh, Antoine, Ty, Upper Scuffy, and then Frank, and then I'm going to close it out. Help some, help some guy today. Um, I would say to the person who's struggling today to figure it out, who's struggling to, to who's struggling at in this pit, um, that it's not a final destination. Uh, one of the greatest flaws or failures that I think we embrace is that our mistakes are where we have to be forever. Um, and if you allow your, like the Bible says, right, my sin is ever before me. Um, if you keep that sin in front of your face all the time, that is all you will see. It is all you will believe you are capable of, and it is all you will ever live up to. Um, but the, the beauty that God is able to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, for me, if you're asking me how somebody gets, for me, it's, it's turning to God, it's turning to faith. For me, it's realizing that you messed up and being honest and open enough um, in that conversation with God, right? Because people always say God knows my heart. Yeah, God does know your heart. Um, but, but there's power in confessing where you fell short. Right. Giving that over to God to to allow God to make you whole, to make to allow God to heal you, and through that process, you won't be so concerned about what other people think or other people trying to remind you that you messed up. Yeah, I messed up, but that was yesterday. Today's a new day. I'm making a different decision today. I'm acting differently today, and why? Because I think differently today. So you can mess up, but you don't have to stay in that place. It starts with making your mind up want different. For me, as I said, it's a faith thing, trusting God to help you become different. Very good. Very good. Ty? You know, I, I, if, if there were young men listening or older men listening, I would like to say that just to understand that if you, if you have fallen, that we all have fallen at some point. Right. And mainly whatever you're going through, if it's an addiction of any type, we all have went through our own individual issues. Okay. If you're going through a fear of maybe you didn't have dad in the house, we all have did that. Not all of us, obviously. Some dads were there. But we all have had issues growing up that we weren't whole or didn't feel whole. Right. So I would say you can make it. You 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 will make it. Um, I've often talked to a lot of young men and I, I do offer and say that you should try and become more of a spiritual man. Recognize your fears. Recognize what God says about your situation. Now, because 
books change, magazines change, authors change what you do, okay. but the Bible doesn't change. It will tell you what you should be doing and check you forever and ever of your life. And so if you can, young man, young lady, if you can adhere to those principles, just sit back and watch the change. So I would say, again, as I said earlier, that young man who's struggling, your job, your, your house, your home, your kids, whatever, is that try and seek someone as a mentor. We all should have a mentor. I believe that. I just believe that. We all should have a mentor. Someone that he may not have been successful in everything, but there are some things that you can just talk to him about. How do you handle this? I always told someone, you know, I've been married 36 years, and they said, wow, that's a long time. You don't see that. And I said, yeah, try to make 37. <laughs> and I, I can learn from someone, guess what, who's been married 40. Right, right. And so, young man, try to learn from someone who has a home, who's been laid off and now working again. Ah. <laughs> try, try, who's maybe try to talk to someone who has a couple of kids and has been successful with them. See how he acts with his wife and how she reacts with him. And take a look at that and, and be, hopefully have a conversation where you can talk to him openly because men need to speak with men. We need to be able to have that openness because there's a lot of fear and there's a lot of things that go on in our head that we need someone to share with. We need to, someone to explain us and answer some things. Right. So I would say, try to find a mentor, try to find a good you know, a, a spiritual base if you don't have one already, try to find a good spiritual base and attach yourself to a, someone who's a success. Very good, very good, very good. I'll go scuff you, then Pastor Frank, and I'm gonna go. As all of you were talking, I thought about uh, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, and it says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not to thy own understanding. All thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. And I think uh, I would say to a young man, a young lady that's struggling, pray to God that you will get to the point to wherein you don't need others to validate who you are. Ah. Mm. You don't need others to validate who you are. Start working on who you are rather than who you are, and you'll find success because we've all been down, but thank God he picked us up. And I think that we have to come to realize that if we just keep our hands, as the old folks say, to the gospel plow and don't look back, we'll be all right. All right, all right, that's right. Now I was going to talk about mentorship also, but I covered that very well. So I'm going to talk. I want to say something to those of us who are fathers who haven't stepped up to the table. Um, we our kids need us more than you realize. Some of our kids are acting out because we're not being there and being the father and the leader of the house that we could be. Okay. As far as my own family. My kids have never seen my wife and I argue in front of them. No. Um, they've seen love. They've seen support. Um, we've had other kids come to our house when the kids were growing up because they looked at us as their role models. But you need to take care of your own family. Sometimes we're spending so much time being a mission for someone else that our own kids are flying away. Ah. So, so stay at home. Fix home first. And that's where mm -hmm. the foundation is going to be. They okay. want them from you. They may be acting out, but they, they, they're waiting for you to interact with them and correct them. They're looking for that radical correction. They're looking for that discipline because they know that's the sign of love from you. So stay home, handle your business, both as a father and as a husband. So take care of business because the foundation of the whole community starts at the house level. So take care of your home first. Oh, that's good. That's good. Before I go, I want to give uh, uh, Scuffy, he talked about Asante Farms. Uh, Pastor Frank, uh, Pastor Antoine, I want to give you guys a chance to uh, talk about your books and how people can get them. Pastor Frank and then uh, Antoine, talk about your books, how people can get them. Well, the, my first book that came out last year is called Something Told Me, Note Hearing and Knowing the Voice Inside and Letting God's Spirit Direct You 
into different patterns of your life and not be afraid to walk it, walk out in faith when God tells you to do so. Um, so it's my own testimonial of uh, chronologically from the 70s all the way up to the present time of how God has interacted in my life. And News Flash, I'm working on another book. It's called Access Denied. And it's how the subtitle will be Self-Destructive Ways to Miss Out on the Promises of God. So uh, anybody here, I'll have it done. Okay, somebody told me. How can people get that? On Amazon. Okay. Number two, Amazon. That's Antoine. Prepare to take off. So, yep. Prepare to take off is a book that um, talks about overcoming uh, your beliefs and behaviors that are blocking your best life. And so it's really based on my own experience um, because I realized that, that there are folks like me whose own thought processes and behaviors they're doing are actually interrupting the plan that God has for them. Wow. Uh, Prepare for Takeoff is available on Amazon um, or on my own website at AntoineGarrett.com. Um, there's another book that I co-authored called Emerge, uh, and, and that chapter I wrote in there is about breaking free from the chains that are holding you back, and that link is also on AntoineGarrett.com. Very good, very good. Husbands, fathers, brothers, sons, uncles, and nephews, these gentlemen here have talked to us about overcoming, about uh, issues about support and my own story lets me know that you can make it you can make it through low self-esteem you can make it through being frustrated you can make it through being a young kid who used to fight all the time you can make it from uh, being a guy who got married and didn't have a clue of what he was supposed to be doing making mistakes with uh, my wife making mistakes, with my son making mistakes, but my son called me yesterday. Yesterday was my birthday. My son called me yesterday. My friend called me saying happy birthday to me. Uh, son called me. Uh, people. And so my point being that you can come through those things. Mm -hmm. Where you are does not have to be where you stay. Mm -hmm. You right. can over you can get through you've got a gift talent skill that somebody wants and you can make money from it you can support your family from it you can get through you can overcome as uh jesse used to say you are somebody and you were somebody before jesse said it so i just want to tell you that as a man we can change the narrative talk about the good things uh talk about brothers who are riding books, <laughs> buying farms taking care of their family uh eating cardiac apartments talk about talk to and about those brothers let people see those brothers that are married 43 years 20 years 36 years 42 years 38 years and that we are married mm -hmm. but we didn't always know what we were doing but we turned around got it together learn how to pray and say yes dear <laughs> be a partner communicate and you can make it yeah. and somebody said one of the best things that they've learned about marriage is to keep other folk out of your business mm -hmm. that's so right all i'm saying is you can do it you can make it and if you watch any of my programs you know my closing line is that your dream is doable go get it it's up to you it can be done i trust that these gentlemen talking has helped you in some way you can contact them and brothers uh my grandfather mr ben Shig, would always say people don't have to do nothing grown folks don't have to do nothing you tell them so when they do you ought to say thank you sophie thank you frank thank you antoine thank you and ty uh ever since eighth grade audio visual at folk Shea junior high school thank you brother yes now, sir that's a blessing <laughs> I appreciate it and continue. If you want to watch or find any of my other videos, you can go to uh, Encourage Mint, M I N T. You can go to YouTube, Dwayne Chig. You don't have to worry. I'm the only Dwayne Chig on there. You won't uh, uh, mess up anything. You can find some more stuff on YouTube. Uh, my books are on Amazon. You can go to Amazon, put in my last name, Chig. You're only going to see three people on there me, my brother, and my cousin, Simeon. So you won't get confused. Uh, but, or you can contact me for uh, my. Book, go get it, move forward, and June 20th, my latest book, Encouragements from a Formerly Frustrated uh, Dreamer. But in all sincerity, thank you, gentlemen. I trust that people have been helped. 
Uh, you can contact me at drshig at gmail.com. These gentlemen have given their information where they you can contact them. Uh, Ty, give us your email address in case somebody wants to contact you. I'm at uh, tknowles8 at gmail.com. Gentlemen, thank you so much. You have a great day, the great rest of your day. Uh, you in Texas, Frank, in Baltimore, uh, Pastor Antoine, Uncle Scuffy uh, in Inglewood, and Ty all the way from Crenshaw on the 105 freeway. <laughs> thank you God so bless you. You brothers be blessed. Take it easy. Right. Thank you. Thank all you. Right. All right. Bye-bye.